Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to MST.TV. This is Nishi here bringing you all yet another Market Watch episode. I know we just talked about some stuff yesterday, but with the latest ban list, there were so many things changing that we just couldn't cover all of them in one episode. So yesterday we talked about some of the really huge major price shifts going on around the market, talking about cards like Harpy's Feather Duster and Plague Spreader Zombie. Well today, instead, we're going to talk about some of the more low-key price shifts, cards that maybe weren't extremely obvious, but are still important shifts that you should all be aware of nonetheless. A lot of the time these price trends will show what cards and strategies people will be looking at playing in the current meta, so it's definitely important to keep up with them as much as possible. Let's get started. Kicking things off, let's take a look at a couple more of the Phantom Knight cards. So yesterday we talked about Rusty Bardiche and Fogblade, with those two being really key power cards in the deck. Well, Silent Boots and Ancient Cloak are two other important pieces for the strategy that really help the deck be able to function. You can banish either of these cards from your graveyard to activate their effects, with Silent Boots allowing you to search for a Phantom Knight spell or trap, and Ancient Cloak allowing you to search for any Phantom Knight's card. These two cards are some of the best utility that the deck has available, as you can toolbox any piece of the Phantom Knight engine from your deck. For you budget players out there, thankfully these cards are available as commons from the Legendary Hero decks, and unlike Fogblade, they are relatively affordable, and you should be able to pick them up for under a dollar or so each. However, for the higher rarity, harder to find versions, you will have to pay up a little bit more for those. Secret rare boots are quite expensive at $8 each, though the super rares from Wing Raiders are pretty cheap as well. And then with Ancient Cloak, the secret rares are actually only $5 or so, because the original print ultra rares are harder to find and harder to pull, sitting now at around $10 each. One other card worth noting that isn't pictured here is Ragged Gloves, who we talked about last week, a card that only has the one holo version available as a super rare print from an OTS tournament pack, which is actually up to $13 each as well. Now, admittedly, the secret rares do look really, really nice, and that's the rarity I would prefer to play them in for myself, but that's just me. The commons, of course, have the exact same effects. It is worth noting, though, that each of these cards already has high rarity and low rarity printings, right? So it's not like another reprint will tear down the value of those higher rarity versions. If you're the kind of person that wants to bling out your decks and get those things in highest rarity, you can maybe wait a week or two for some of that ban list hype to die down, but then go ahead and pick them up because they are likely still to retain value in the long run. Next up, we're looking at some Burning Abyss cards, and basically for the same reason as we're looking at Phantom Knights, right? The two archetypes are joint at the hip, so if we're talking about one engine, there's a good chance that we're probably going to be talking about things from the other as well. So what it's looking like so far is that any play we're going to be seeing from Burning Abyss moving forward is going to be a more simplified version of the deck combined with Phantom Knights, right? Where we're just playing with Graf, Seer, and Skarm from the Burning Abyss side, just like back when Duelist Alliance first introduced the archetype. There are, of course, other cards like Farfa and Libic, but from what I've seen from people trying out the deck, it seems like they're just sticking with the few key Burning Abyss cards and leaving the rest of the slots for things like the Phantom Knight engine. Now that being said, the original Burning Abyss cards in their hollow form have seen a bit of a bump up in terms of price. Graf and Skarm both have Astral Pack super rare versions available, while Graf, Seer, and Skarm, as well as all of the other Burning Abyss main deck monsters, are all available as gold rares as well. Now, for the golds, we're looking at about $6 for Graf or Seer, and then $8 for Skarm, whereas with the supers, it's about $6 for Graf, and then $10 for Skarm. Now, it's worth noting that Skarm has kind of always been worth a few bucks, as Skarm has always been at 3, and it's been a mainstay in Burning Abyss decks, even when the deck maybe wasn't so relevant. Graf and Seer are the ones that just went from 1 to 2 on the most recent ban list, and they could definitely see a bit of a bump up again if they were to go to 3 on a future list. A lot of people probably already have their copies of Skarm if they were wanting to play Burning Abyss from before, but Graf and Seer should be a little bit easier to move. I know that a lot of people only had one of each for their cores and never bothered picking up extra copies. Nevertheless, even if you can dig out some of like the simple rare copies, I think that Burning Abyss cards are a popular enough archetype that they will be in quite high demand from the player base, so I would definitely recommend digging whatever you can out of your bulk so that you can move them as soon as possible. So with hits on the ban list to Jet Synchron and O-Lion, people are scrambling a little bit to find viable tuner monsters to play that can be summoned off of Halky Fibrax. Yesterday we talked about Plague Spreader Zombie, which is definitely a great choice, but another card that has caught some people's attention is Recover, a level 1 psychic tuner monster. This card allows you to potentially summon it out of the graveyard as well by paying 2,000 life points if your opponent has 5 more cards in their extra deck than you do. 
situational obviously but definitely worth considering so that you have the option available it's also worth noting that this card can be summoned off of emergency teleport as it is a psychic monster which some combo decks were already playing alongside cyframe gear gamma and it's a level one earth tuner so you can use it to make something like naturia beast depending on the deck that you're playing Ultimately, I think it'll depend on what level tuner you need access to, so Recover is definitely going to be a solid choice moving forward, though it's by no means going to be the standard the same way that Olion and Jet Synchron used to be. Now there's only one holo version of Recover available from the Primal Origin Deluxe Edition, which was what we got for a very short while in place of the Special Editions, kind of like the way that the Deluxe Trainer Boxes work in Pokemon at the moment. It wasn't a very popular product and it is from quite an old set, so for Super Recover, covers you're looking at paying a whole eight dollars a piece at the moment which is a lot for a card like this i definitely consider looking at picking up a common which you can still get for 25 cents or so since i definitely wouldn't want to be spending eight dollars on a brick in my deck that i might not even end up using Speaking of main deck bricks, Mecha Phantom Beast Coltwing is the card that everyone seems to be looking at as a replacement for Olion, a monster that you can summon off of Aurorodon. Despite being level 4 and not being a tuner, its effect allows you to summon two Mecha Phantom Beast tokens to your field when it's special summoned. This allows you to trigger the effect of Deskbot 001 while it's in your graveyard, summoning itself out and giving you access to another tuner in that way. It's a pretty cool interaction, though obviously it's a huge brick in your deck if you draw it, since Aurorodon can't special summon from your hand. Overall, I don't know if this is something that's going to be seeing a ton of play moving forward, since you do need to be using the whole deskbot package in order to take advantage of it. And with Coltwing, it isn't a tuner, right? So it's not like you can use it to go into Halky Fibrax, or you can't summon it off of Halky Fibrax anyways. But yeah, there's only two common printings of this card available, and I definitely didn't think to set this card aside when I was digging through my boxes of bulk, so I'm gonna have to try to dig for this card. We're currently looking at $3 a piece at the moment, which is a lot for some random card that pretty much everyone has always disregarded as just being another bulk common. At $3 each, if you opened a ton of Judgment of the Light, it's probably worth looking through it and pulling them aside to move, especially if more and more hype continues to build around this card moving forward. So I know I mentioned yesterday that I didn't think that Monarchs were a particularly viable strategy in the year 2020, but apparently people still want to try and bling out their Monarch decks to try and cheese people out of wins with the Domain Lock and Vanity's Fiend. Which is pretty fair because if your opponent doesn't have the out then they just lose, and that's kind of hilarious. But yeah, so Monarchs were really affordable for the most part, with most of the cards being available in the Monarch structure deck itself. However, two key cards for the strategy were printed as super rares in OTS tournament packs, those being Domain of the True Monarchs and the Prime Monarch. Domain is actually pretty notable as a consistent 3 of in the strategy, also where supers are up at $10 each, but even the commons are $5 or so. And then with super rare Prime Monarchs, this is the trap monster from back in those days. You run either 2-3 to three copies of this card, it's also $10 a piece for the super rares, but only a dollar or so for the commons. There are other cards that have spiked, like Return of the Monarchs in Ultra Rare, but I'm highlighting these two cards here because they are cards that came out in tournament exclusive packs for the holo versions. Remember that for the most part when we're looking at these spikes, these are just for the higher rarity versions of the card. If you exclude domain, you can still pick up the cards in lower rarity versions for very, very cheap. So if you're wanting to just pick up a Monarch Core or just have one available for use, I would definitely look at picking up the commons and the lowest rarity versions instead and selling off the higher rarities while there's some hype for the deck. Next up, we have a pretty big one that I didn't talk about yesterday. Power Tool Dragon is a card that hasn't really seen too much play recently, but is seeing a huge increase in demand because it's being looked at as a synchro option in the Infer Noble Knight deck. Its effect allows you to reveal three equipped spells from your deck, and then add one of them randomly to your hand, which is pretty cool because you could just reveal three copies of the same thing, and then get a guaranteed add. A few of my friends are pretty big on the Infer Noble Knight deck as well, and from all the lists that I've seen and that they've looked over, it's looking like Power Tool Dragon as a generic level 7 synchro is a staple in the extra deck for that particular strategy now. Now of course we've actually seen every single version of Power Tool Dragon increase in price significantly. Naturally, the Ghost Rares are the highest rarity version, so we're now looking at something ridiculous like $200 for the Unlimiteds, and then $400 plus for the first editions, obviously with very few quantities available on the market. 
Ultimate Rares, same story. There's a few quantities, but we're looking at around $90 or so a piece. And then even for the Ultras, we're seeing around $45 for a near mint first edition copy. But the scary thing is that for even the lower rarities, the prices are kind of up there. The secret rares from the old tins are up at $20 each. And even the commons from Legendary Collection 5Ds are $15 each, which is just ridiculous for a common card. To be fair, the card hasn't been printed in quite a while and it's not like Power Tool Dragon is the easiest card to find. If you want to play Infernobles, you'll probably have to pay up for this card because it is looking like a staple for the deck and I don't know when exactly they're going to get around to reprinting it. Hopefully that reprint is soon or hopefully you have a friend that's been playing the game for a really long time that you can borrow one off of if you really need to use it. On the other hand, if you have extra copies that you're not expecting to keep, now is a great time to offload the card for a high price before any sort of reprint comes that can tank it back down. Animadorned Archosaur is a card that I just talked about last week, and unfortunately I was definitely wrong about dinos. I thought it was pretty inevitable that dinosaurs were going to be hit on the list, if not by hitting Oviraptor, then by hitting something like Miscellaneousaurus, so I thought for sure the safest thing to do was to sell off the Archosaur before it tanked in price. However, as we now know, dinosaurs made it through the ban list entirely untouched, and as a result, Archosaur has jumped back up to almost the $50 mark. This is obviously a key card in dino, allowing you to pop the baby Cerasaurus to search for a copy of Double Evolution Pill. Without any hits, dinosaurs definitely are looking like they have the potential to be a top tier deck this format, and Archosaur is one of the few expensive cards in the strategy. I think it's largely going to depend on when we're able to see some sort of tournament results, where we can see if dinosaurs really are a legitimate threat with all of the new cards that exist in the game right now, or if their victory at the Remote Duel Invitational was just a one-time thing. Realistically, even though the deck is really strong, I don't think it becomes the clear favorite in the format or anything like that. Rather, I think that due to its consistency issues, it will move back into that tier 1.5 range, and as a result, we will see Archosaur settle back down to around the $40 mark. And the last card that we're looking at here is Vylon Cube. Apparently this is another interesting tech that is seeing play in the Infernoble Knight deck. This is a level 3 tuner that searches for an equip spell from your deck when sent to the graveyard for the synchro summon of a light monster. I think that the idea here is that you summon Cube off of Halky Fibrax, and then you use Cube and a Linkross token to make Herald of the Arclight, and then search for something like Durandal. Definitely a very interesting line of play that has a lot of potential. I don't know how much better this card necessarily is than some of the other tuner options in the deck, but in theory it sounds really solid. This card however is an older card with just two printings, the DT version which is about $10 each at the moment, and then the super rare print from Hidden Arsenal 5 which is about $7. I don't know just how good Vylon Cube or even the Infer Noble Knight deck in general is going to be. But just going off of the ban list and what I've seen so far, the only thing that got hit on Infernobles is the O-Lion, but they have other lines of play that they can take because they do have access to the Assault or the Genba, and I think that Infernoble Knight is going to be a top tier deck moving forward this format. I'm just not 100% sold on Vylon Cube yet, but I do think it has a lot of potential. I would probably want to try to grab at least a single copy of it to set aside for yourself just in case you do want to use it, but then move any extra copies that you have while it's hyped up just to be on the safe side. Alright guys, that is it for today's episode. There's definitely a lot of stuff to unpack here with so many changes on the ban list. We're almost definitely going to see a ton of other changes over the next couple of weeks as the meta shapes up because with this list, it's hard to say exactly what is going to be the best deck of the upcoming format. It'll definitely be interesting to see what decks are going to be able to survive their hit and how that balances out with decks that actually receive notable buffs. But if you guys enjoyed today's Market Watch episode, please be sure to hit that thumbs up button for me as it does help out a ton. Also, make sure you leave a comment in the comment section down below. Let me know what else is going on with the market that maybe I didn't cover in today's episode so I can hopefully cover it in a future episode as well. And also, if you guys haven't already for whatever reason, please consider subscribing to both Tombox and myself here on the channel. And until next time, guys, don't forget to hold on to your MST.TV.